If you're here to listen to the first presentation, you're in the right place. Most of you are in the right uniform, and uh, it's the right time. Let's, if you wouldn't mind, start this morning with the Pledge of Allegiance. Let's, let's revel in how good it feels to do that still for a minute. Because the men, the two men that I'm going to talk about this morning, they, rem they were part of a country where that Pledge of Allegiance was common. They're proud of you. One of them is no longer with us, but Jack Singlaub sends his regards, and he's proud of you all here. Uh, this is going to be, it's sort of, you're going to, it's sort of going to be just a talk about two friends of mine, some of them friends of yours and uh, teammates and former commanders of yours. Jack wanted me to say a special thanks to those Mac VSOG vets that are in here, and send his kind regards to you. Because I'm a retired soldier, you have to have an agenda in your PowerPoint briefings. <laughs> so, I am, I'm Mitch Utterback. I'm a, my, my bio blurb was in the program, but I'm, I dropped out of fraternity lifestyle in the, and enlisted in the Army in 82, and had the privilege of being an SF baby at Fort Devens, uh, serving active duty reserve and National Guard until 2015 when I got to 20 years in a full retirement. And there are some of you in this room that I'm proud to say that I served with uh, in active duty. My very first supervisor, Sergeant Bill McLean is sitting right there. Billy, raise your hand. We don't, you know, no speech is required. I was PFC and Billy was a sergeant. I was light weapons. You remember those, right? Not if I can find a light one, sir. Uh, Billy and I were light weapons and I was the latest nug out of uh, the Q course and Billy was my boss. Several years later, I got recruited out of German DLI to go to the Berlin unit and I wound up serving with Rick Turcott, right there. Maverick Turcott, the famous team sergeant, Rick Turcott. Rick and I now work together in uh, Robin Sage. Lee Jacobs and Charlie Einod are back there, 12th group teammates of mine. Uh, Bruce Long, who you saw here, one of the chapter presidents and event organizers. Uh, Master Sergeant Long and I served together. That's how, that's how connected we are that Mitch Utterback and Bruce Long served together in A519 at Salle. But enough about me. I'm just glad to be back here with my brothers and my teammates. You are my brothers and my teammates. And for those of you that served before me, I stand here as your uh, direct descendant. Direct descendant, the things that you put into the Q course and that you put into the SF regiment, they, they live on today through men like me and through Rick. I am a, he and I are eyewitnesses to the training that goes into our special forces soldiers right now during the Robin Sage exercise. And I swear and I promise to you that what you taught us, what passed down through the bloodlines in SF, pumps through our veins and it is pumped into these Q course students, whether they like it or not. <laughs> and they kind of don't like it until it's over. It's sort of like hitting yourself in the hand with a hammer. Feels good when you stop. But we're giving them 110% uh, during Robin Sage, and we just want you to know that what you would want to be happening is happening, and uh, we are making it happen. 
Anyway, this is what we're going to be talking about. I'm going to advance the slide deck. You're going to, we're going to talk a few minutes about why this is important, I believe. Give you a World War II history refresher from our ancestry, our SF ancestry. I'm going to talk about Bob Kehoe, the radio operator, or as they called him back then, the wireless telegrapher, the WT on Jed Team Frederick. And I'm going to talk about many of you who know him as Colonel Sing Lao, Mac VSOG commander in the late 60s, but when he was the commander of Jed Team James, he was Lieutenant Sing Lao. Then we'll have a little bit of discussion and questions and some of your remembrances if you'd like to share them. So why? Why, why are you sitting here after those Halloween colored donuts and a cup of coffee earlier this morning? Well, this is, my, this is part of my uh, editorial, and maybe you'll agree that in our country, history has a, has a way of being re sometimes retold and rewritten. Sometimes we're told the history that we grew up with should be changed and re-looked at and reinterpreted. Happens all the time. But our special forces history is not immune to this. So what we're doing this morning, not that I've seen it happen, but it's, it's possible. Everything, all parts of our great country's history uh, can be retold in a way that we, would, we might disagree with. So I'm here to t today to remind us that our history will fade before our very eyes unless we pay attention to it, unless we remember it. And uh, we have to protect it from being redirected or revised in some way. And I don't have concrete examples. I just, you feel it, you see it like I do, that suddenly one of your heroes, that, uh, one of our American heroes is now a bad man or a bad person and his statue has to be taken down or put away. There's places that don't say the Pledge of Allegiance anymore because it might upset somebody. You know, our World War II forefathers, uh, Billy and I were talking, Billy McLean and I were talking about this yesterday. Our World War II forefathers from the Office of Strategic Services, they, they left more to us than some of us think about or realize, uh, especially going through the Q course. You know, in, in the last few years when I've dedicated my limited free time to study in the special operations history of the OSS, special operations branch, I have, I have studied what they went through, watched the films, read the manuals, and came to realize, holy crap, that's the same stuff that was in the Q course in the 80s that you Vietnam vets imparted through your experience in the 60s to us in the 80s. But guess where you guys in the 60s got it from? From Civitella and Bank and guys like that. They're literally, you know how in the, in the Army we don't like, if we, can't, if we don't need to create something that already exists, let's just retype it. Uh, you know, change the font. Um, only have one space after the period now before the next sentence. But the program of instruction for SF in the 60s was very close to the OSS Special Operations Branch program of instruction from 43 and 44. And uh, Mav and Billy, the stuff that we got in the late 70s and the early 80s, very, very close. Especially those of you that might have been instructors at Mott Lake for special operations training in the 80s, SOT, or if you went through SOT in the 80s at Mott Lake, Billy and I went through our ODA 315 in February of 85. As I've looked back through history, that's, that was quite literally OSS training. Nowhere else do you learn to do sentry stalking in the, in the SF back then. We use rubber knives, but sentry stalking and the things that we were taught at SOT were also taught at uh, Area B in Virginia and at uh, Camp X in Ontario, Canada, and in places like Catalina Island out in California. The radio operators, even now, not so much, but the radio operators of the 80s and further back to the 40s went through the exact same training, the exact same training. If there was a leg key in Morse code being sent, 
in uh, 1985, it was exactly how, what Bob Keogh had to learn how to do in 43 and what he did for real in France in 44. So I want to I wanna just put in your minds and in your hearts that you might not have known too much about the JEDs or the OSS when you were a young man going through training. But what you got coursing through your veins now is literally the historic DNA that these men went through also. We, we, we carry it inside us, and I'm, I'm here to tell you this morning how much you are connected to them and they to us. Now, Maverick and I, we see in Robin Sage, there's not a hell of a lot of OSS training going on in the Q course. Is there anybody from SWIC in, in here right now? The Special Warfare Center, SWIC. It's not called IMA anymore, just for some of you guys, like it was when I was a young man. Mav, we, um, we, we in character as the G Chief and the G Sergeant Major, we try to elicit from the students, what do you know about your own American Special Forces history? And we'll throw in something about, oh, you've got a parachute. Did you guys parachute in out of a bomber? Like uh, your forefathers did in World War II? Uh, no, Chief, we uh, landed by helicopter. Okay. Um, so we, through, we pretend as Pinelanders that we have studied military history over the many uh, centuries. And we're particularly interested in your American military history of World War II. Captain, go ahead and tell the Sergeant Major and I something about your special operations history of World War II. Uh, well, Chief, um, uh, there was something about uh, advising the resistance back then. What, what we think, what we, what we have come to realize is there must be like a 40-minute PowerPoint briefing that they get that the room's 95 degrees and they've been up for 14 hours and it's after a heavy meal. It's like that scene in G.I. Jane or something. Uh, yes, Dirty Secret, I've seen that movie. By the way, that's uh, Tilt Meyer's favorite movie. Is he in here? He loves seals. Um, so anyway, being here this morning makes y'all a force multiplier for carrying our history forward, and that's what we want to. That's what we want to leave here with. Okay, quick refresher. So the special operations executive during World War II was uh, inspired by Winston Churchill. You've heard his famous phrase, maybe "Set Europe ablaze." Ever heard that? He wanted to create an outfit that would set Europe ablaze. It was uh, created in 1940, and it was to do everything that Colonel Hogan and the guys at Stalag 13 did. Uh, <laughs> remember? I mean, you look back now like, holy crap, Hogan's Heroes was a great tutorial for going into SF in the future. Because they did all that stuff. Um, the espionage, sabotage, subversion, recon, direct action, and unconventional warfare. By the way, that's what guerrilla warfare is called nowadays, unconventional warfare. <sighs> it's, still, it's still okay. It's not too squishy yet. But some, who knows, someday it might be turned and be called not so nice warfare. <laughs> I'm, I'm not lying, you, you, you know it could happen. Someday when it's, the doctrine is now not so nice warfare. It used to be unconventional, it used to be guerrilla. So, William Donovan, Wild Bill Donovan, World War I Medal of Honor recipient from the fight in the 69th, successful Wall Street attorney and one of the few Republicans that FDR listened to during that time, uh, pitched a, an organization that was first called Coordinator of Information to bring together all the different intel gathering sources of the U.S. government and put them under one roof. And then Roosevelt said, go with the Office of Strategic Services in 1942. Now, it was uh, an executive branch creation that reported to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. It didn't rise up out of a branch of the military, as you probably know. And that's why... Uh, when you read, when you Google or read the, our SF lineage, there is not a direct descendancy from the OSS because it was a civilian outfit. 
And as some of you that knew Aaron Bank, I'll do my Aaron Bank impression. Colonel Bank told me uh, at his assisted living facility one Christmas, Billy, you were, I think you were there too. He said, I never agreed with the Pentagon when they didn't give us our OSS lineage. They drew it to the Special Service Force, but it was really the OSS, as specifically the operational groups. Roger that, Colonel. Yes, sir. So, Google now. I mean, there's even interesting editorials written about should we, should we petition to have our OSS history be drawn directly to, to now? I would say yes. So Project Jedberg. Project Jedberg was created through the OSS Special Operations Branch, as you know, to send a multinational three-man team into France and the Low Countries, like Holland, to uh, link up with the resistance, to advise and assist them, and most importantly at the time, to establish radio communications and call-in supplies, call-in bundle drops. And they were very successful. Uh, many, much has been written by generals from World War II, Eisenhower I, and between one and seven divisions of big army is credited to the accomplishments of the OSS just in France during the war. I said a little bit all already about the training that they went through. Most of us feel we've been through parts of it already. Um, many of these men, well, they were all recruited through some kind of announcement. Aaron Bank heard the announcement for a briefing for a unit that could guarantee immediate overseas assignment. Uh, he was at Fort Polk. He was a transportation officer, the poor guy. Railroad. Can you imagine? If Aaron Bank had not heard that briefing, Aaron Bank, who was like a 1930s version of a personal trainer, which is, that's what a physical culturist was, by the way. Colonel Bank was a physical culturist. Modern terminology, personal trainer. For like rich European people. And uh, he spoke a couple languages, thank God. And he, I think, wasn't he 40? 40 or 42 when he heard the brief. Thank goodness he heard the briefing. And these were done over loudspeakers. It was done over uh, loudspeakers at Camp McCall. It was done over a loudspeaker in Camp Crowder, Missouri. That's where Bob Kehoe heard it. And uh, there were announcements at Fort Benning. And that's where Jack Singlaub heard it. And thank God we had men like this to listen. Like, hey, that's, that sounds way more exciting than what I'm doing right now. Connect that to yourselves. Y'all chose, at some point, to go to SF training, as opposed to whatever else we were doing before that. Uh, there's a bullet in here that says uh, operational groups. And there's not, there's not a lot out there about the OGs, the operational groups. But they were 15-man teams of the OSS, Special Operations Branch, with geographic orientation through their family lineage. And they had language capability. And they had multiple MOSs, weapons, communications, medics. And they had two officers on their team. What, who could argue that Colonel Bank, that's why I said the OGs are the ODA. So there you have it. OSS had 15-man teams, operational groups, commanded by two officers, multiple MOSs, that parachuted into occupied countries. Many of these guys' parents were immigrants, or even they were. Most of them spoke the language of the country that they jumped into or landed into. They did advising and assisting and calling in resupply, but they really took the fight to the Germans. They did a lot, a lot of DA, a lot of direct action. After, after we wrapped up, after we kicked Nazi ass in Europe, uh, there was a hundred Jedbergs themselves that said, um, I got a lot of skills and I'm in it for the, for the duration, 
signed me up for the China Burma India Theater. And Bob Kehoe and Jack Singlob were two of the OSS Jedburgh vets that deployed to China. If you can see, this is sort of an eye chart, but there's a little pictures of books down in the lower right corner of that slide. These are three great books to read. If you can get them from the library or buy them on Amazon, you, like me, can be a self-proclaimed subject matter expert on the OSS in World War II. Uh, I've read some books. I stayed at the Orleans Hotel last night, therefore I must be a subject matter expert. One of the, this first one, The Jedbergs, was written, written by SF Lieutenant Colonel Retired Will Irwin. Does anybody know Will Irwin these days, or is he around? Great. Please give him my compliments, and it was, uh, it was through his book that he wrote in 2007 that I met Bob. The, uh, the next book is about the Jedbergs, Albert Lu... Uh, what's Al's last name? Lelouchi or something like that. This book, the blue book, is called Donovan's Devils, and it's about the operational groups. Great. I would encourage you to read Will Irwin's book first, and then read the operational groups. And then there's a book called Special Operations in China, uh, written by OSS and SF vets from that time. And uh, these three books will make you, uh, will open your eyes, and will all feel familiar, and you'll, will, you will... You'll know more than most of the regiment about our SF history, and you would be empowered to walk in any time to the uh, historian's office at Fort Bragg and sit down over coffee and argue the fine points of our OSS history. Bob Kehoe, he was born in New Jersey in, uh, on this date in 1922, May 23rd. Sadly, he died uh, last October in Boulder, Colorado. And Bob didn't die from COVID. He died from complications from spinal stenosis. But we're gonna talk a little bit about Bob, and then we're gonna talk about Jack Singlob. Bob was 21 years old at Camp Crowder, Missouri, going through radio operator training, when the loudspeaker said, uh, there will be a briefing for volunteers who are interested in immediate overseas assignment at the Post Theater at 1600. Now that part I made up, but it sounded real. But it was a Camp Crowder loudspeaker announcement and Bob said, Ooh, I, he had, he's told me, I felt like I had more to give. I felt like being a radio operator was interesting and important, but I felt that I had more to give my country, and I just was a young man, and I knew I had the physical ability to do it, and I liked the challenge, so I decided to go to the briefing. Sorry about that. That's Bob in the middle at age 22. Bob was the radio operator on Jedberg Team Frederick. Jed Team Frederick uh, was comprised of, uh, on the left side is uh, Paul Augurek, a uh, French lieutenant. And on, the, on, the right on your right is uh, Adrian Wise, Major Adrian Wise. This was one of the very few, just a handful, 10% of Jedberg teams that were tri-national. And uh, these guys got along famously. During their training, they, weren't, they, they voted themselves to come together. OS Jedberg training in England at Milton Hall in Peterborough, England, uh, they had all the Jeds there together. And then would, they would put them out on field training exercises that the British called schemes, schemes. So they, were out, they went on a couple of schemes together, and they realized, hey, we got a good team dynamic here. So they told the chain of command at Milton Hall, hey, the, the three of us would like to work together. Now, the nickname of this was called Getting Married. Isn't that funny now? Like, oh my God, what? So these guys got married at Milton Hall and became Jed Team, Jed Team Frederick. 
the pl Brittany, France. Brittany, France is sort of, you know, imagine, look, okay, you're looking at France, and then you're looking at England, and you can visualize in southern England crossing the channel to the Normandy area. Well, if you look, at, look to the west of Normandy, there's a peninsula that sticks out into the Atlantic. That's the Brittany Peninsula. And that is where uh, some of the best documented Jedburg operations of World War II took place. Jed Team Frederick and Jed Team George, by the way. If you Google Jed, put, go into YouTube, type in Jed Team George, you'll see an hour and a half long black and white debriefing by Paul Sear, the commander of Jed Team George. Now, Frederick and George had very similar missions, parachuting in only about 150 kilometers from each other on the same night. And there's a connection. There's a grain of history that Bob Kehoe gave me about these two teams that are it's never, documented nowhere, written down nowhere, didn't exist, and I'm going to share it with you all in a minute. So Team Frederick, they jumped in from uh, British Sterling bombers. British Sterling bombers in 1944 were already obsolete, and the Brits were using them for infilling jet teams. Of course, they also jumped from blacked out beef 24s. You may have heard of the carpet baggers, uh, aviation unit of World War II. But Jed Team Frederick jumped from a British Sterling bomber on the night of June 9th, or as we say in the more recent military, period of darkness, 9, 10, June, 44. You can, if you want to say that, you can say, see, period of darkness, if you want to like confuse members of your family. If you're doing something at night and it's going to be after midnight, but you're still going to be doing it, well, what, what, when are you going to leave? When are you going to get here? I don't know, Mom. Sometime period of darkness, Saturday, Sunday. <laughs> Son, I don't know what that means. That's how I talk to my mother, though. She's 82. I'd like to confuse her. It's not hard. I am. She said, that's mean. So Bob, he was promoted to E8 while in the field in France. And like uh, the special dispensation for our special mission unit at Fort Bragg, where there's more sergeant major slots assigned than anywhere in the military. Uh, the OSS, the Jedbergs, they got a large number of E-8 slots, and a 22-year-old radio operator was promoted to master sergeant, or uh, first sergeant, as they were called, in the field on the ground in France. And he decoded that message himself. And how about that for a present? You're sitting there, freezing your ass off, writing it, copying code, you go back, you, you break out your trigraph, which they did, and you write it on your one-time pad, which they had. Rick, they were the same sizes as the ones that you and I had to carry. Yeah. And uh, he sees, congratulations, Peseta. That was his co co code name. Congratulations, Peseta, on promotion to first sergeant. And he was still proud of that when he told me, they promoted me to first sergeant in the field. I thought that was wonderful. <laughs> Bob was, uh, he was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross for his duties as a radio operator on Jed Team Frederick. As you know, the DSC is second only uh, to the Medal of Honor. Bob never missed a contact when he had his radios. There was times when he had to hide his radios and they had to escape and evade. But then Bob went back and found his radio, crossed through German-occupied territory at night, by himself. Well, there was one French uh, 4th Battalion SAS French guy that went with him, but they separated, and Bob went back into an area that the Germans had run them out of in the dark and recovered his 40-pound Jedburg radio and then made comms to say, I've got my radio back. I remember in 1983 at the end of uh, Robin Sage, Major Bob Howard, uh, making a 18 echo, well, a radio operator, not an echo then, made a radio operator stand up and 
square-jawed freedom fighter Major Howard said, that man right there is the best one of you. He made every contact during Robin Sage as a radio operator. He never missed a contact. And I don't know if this guy got an Army Commendation Medal or who cares, because Bob Howard stood him up in front of everybody and said, this is the job that you need to do. This, he's, and he explained that he left the G base every day and he went in a different direction and he set up comms and he didn't come back. And I was impressed as a dumbass light weapons PFC that this uh, guy was being, his, he was being honored in such a way. Bob Kehoe, as I read about Bob and listened to his stories, Bob Kehoe would have got the same treatment from Bob Howard had he been going through the Q course. And it made me think, did Bob Howard know? He had to know about what the Jeds went through and, and obviously how important making comms was. So when I, when I read Bob Kehoe's DSC citation, it sounded like what Bob Howard had said in 1983. Bob Kehoe did his job in war and did it well under very difficult conditions. And it wasn't a giveaway DSC, it, it was well earned because tens of thousands of French resistance were armed. Hundreds and hundreds of Germans, bad Germans went the way they were supposed to go. And both his French teammate and his British teammate did the write-up. They didn't give him the DA 638 and say, here, Bob, fill out this for your award. <laughs> Put yourself in for something. By the way, that happens sometimes these days. So Bob also got the French Croix de Guerre with palm leaves, which is a very high award. And he also received one of the higher British awards mentioned in dispatches. Mention in dispatches. So whatever, one of the highest awards of the three countries for whom he served, recognized and, and gave it to him. And this is a picture of him receiving this award in 1946, because the army was still messed up, even then, <laughs> by getting soldiers their awards. Unless there was a photo op. You know, Audie Murphy didn't have to wait very long for his, but the, the Jeds, they had to wait. So this is Bob wearing, he was already wearing his uh, ruptured duck award on the other side of this uniform. He was already out, but um, they said, hey, Kehoe, show up and get your Distinguished Service Cross. There'll be a few photographs, and this is him getting that. After, after a debriefing in December and a little bit of leave in New Jersey, Bob volunteered for service in the China-Burma-India Theater. Now, CBI theater, literally China, Burma, India theater. Why, weren't the, why wasn't the OSS in the rest of the Pacific? One word, MacArthur. I don't want those ruffians. That's my, that's my MacArthur thing. Hands on his hips like this. So MacArthur said, no, no OSS in my AO. Okay, we'll go to CBI then. And I just said a bunch of letters and everybody understood what I just said. I could have said CVS, and you said, what's wrong with him? <laughs> so Team Hyena was, uh, it wasn't a Jedburgh team, it was an OSS detachment. The uh, guys in the back row in khakis are the Americans of Team Hyena. Second from the right in that photo is Bob. He has the big head of hair, big head of hair. He was a radio operator on Team Hyena, their mission was not like Bob's mission in France, where he wasn't running for his life. They were to train, they only had, they were, had 150 Chinese nationalists, their partisan force, that they were supposed to train in uh, radio, sa railroad sabotage mostly. But even then, the Chinese were mostly about having a civil war to see if Chiang hai Shek or, or Mao's forces were gonna be victorious, and fighting the Japanese was secondary. But any opportunity they could have to get the Americans to put a hurt on the Japanese, they took advantage of it. But from 
my reading of OSS in China, uh, the Chinese, both the communists and the nationalists, were hard to deal with. Uh, same ass pain that we go through these days with our host nation partners in different parts of the world. Their agendas were ahead of fighting the Japanese. So Bob had some time to monkey around on the obstacle course. This photo on the left is Bob hanging from the obstacle course after they had put up part of it, which he was one of the guys that helped drag the trees and put the thing up. And they said, hey, Kehoe, try out the obstacle course. So there he is with a smile on his face. And that's a picture of him on the, on the other side on a Chinese boat with a straw hat full of pears. And he told me that those were delicious pears, the best he's ever had, the biggest pears, and uh, he was hoarding them. So he had a picture made with a big straw hat full of Chinese pears. And look at that beautiful head of hair. And also, as an OSS history buff, look at the cool uh, jungle uniform that he had on. Um, not Other than the slant pockets, something that uh, some of you guys wore in uh, the mid-60s. It had epaulets on the shoulders, good pockets, and when you got something that worked, 20 years later it was working for some of you guys too. Probably not the exact same issue, but wouldn't it, wouldn't it have been something to find a, a tag in your uniform, a laundry tag that said Kehoe or Singlaub <laughs> when you got it at CIF? Boy, that would have been something. So I met, I met Bob by, I put down Will Irwin's book a couple years ago. So I read The Jedbergs by Will Irwin. And in the back of the book it said, where are they now? Now this book was written in 07. Where are they now? I read the back and it said, the back Will had written, Bob Kehoe and his wife Anne live in Boulder, Colorado. And I stopped right there and I says, wait a second. I live in the Democratic People's Republic of Boulder, Colorado myself. <laughs> There's another SF guy on a stay-behind mission, on a singleton stay-behind mission here. <laughs> so, being the uh, modestly computer literate retired SF guy that mo many of us are, I just cyber-stalked him. Bob and Ann Kehoe. Sadly, I found Ann's obituary. She had died nine years earlier from Parkinson's disease. Bob and Ann had addresses, though, in Boulder, and their addresses were on two different streets. These two different streets intersected, and in the southwest corner of this intersection was a large independent and assisted living facility. Well, I googled this place. I called the main number. Now, granted, I just put the book down a few minutes ago. Hello, Fraser Meadows. Hi, my name is Mitch Utterback. I'm a retired Special Forces soldier. I live here in Boulder, and I was wondering if Bob Kehoe is a resident there, if Bob Kehoe is still living, and as a World War II veteran, if he is, I'd just like to spend, to leave him a message and ex show my appreciation for his service during World War II. Oh, that's nice. Let me put you through to his apartment. Voicemail. Hello, this is Bob. Please leave me a message. I'd be delighted to call you back. Hi, Bob. This is Tell him who I am. Establish my bona fides. Less than an hour later, phone rings. Hello, Mitch. So nice to hear from you. Be delighted to have you come visit. How about tomorrow? <laughs> yes, sir. Bob, uh, I'll be over. What time? Well, uh, come for lunch. They have a fine cafeteria here, and I pay $300 a, a month, and I don't eat that much. Well, sir, I'm going to help you put a dent in that $300. <laughs> so thank you, Will Irwin, for that mention in the book of, about where they live. And I encourage, I encourage all of us, do what I did. You want to meet somebody? that you want to let them know how special they are, if they're a, one, of, uh, one of us, find them, contact them. And uh, I was laughing the whole way and pinching myself and sort of having an Apollo 11 moon landing moment as I'm driving to Bob's place the next day. 
And from that time, for about a, a year and a half, I visited him regularly. Uh, these are, and I posted in SF Brothers on Facebook, uh, and many of you followed along and read those things. Um, sometimes SF Brothers is not so brotherly. <laughs> but I wanted you all to be able to read about uh, Bob, and that's, that's where I put it. So Bob in this picture where he's been over with his readers, now, of course, Bob not only had spinal stenosis, but some macular degeneration and very bad arthritis, and he had many other health, health problems. He, um, but when I met him, he lived an independent living. He had uh, somebody come by for two hours in the morning to help get me started in the morning, and then he had somebody come by in the evening to put me to bed. But for most of the day, he was, he was uh, operating on his own. This picture of him bent over is him with a magnifying glass pointing out his drop zone on the silk evasion map that he's tucked in his cargo pocket before he jumped in. That map jumped into Brittany, France on period of darkness, 9, 10 June, and he still had it. And I looked at it, I said, Bob, this wasn't something you scrounged as a souvenir afterwards. No, I wasn't into souvenirs. This is the one they handed us before we got on the plane. Holy crap. Now his daughter is in possession of this map. This hasn't been sold or donated or anything. The family has this. The family now has this photo and the family's having this map mounted and framed with this photo also. So it'll always be uh, acknowledged for what it was. Unlike some of you modern SF soldiers, Bob kept up on his language proficiency. Yeah. That's more for like my young guys like me and Billy and Billy and Mav. You know, there's a big thing several years ago. It was like the shiny object of SF. Be up on your language proficiency. And if you weren't, there was, there was bless you, little mandatory, um, little mandatory sad face on your evaluation report if you weren't proficient in your assigned language. So Bob's assigned language was French, and Bob at Fraser Meadows Independent Living met with a group of French speakers once a week and they practiced their French. There is a French restaurant in the DPRB, Boulder, Democratic People's Republic of Boulder, uh, called Le French, that Bob would go to when he was healthier and so I took him, and the owner loved him and knew which side her baguettes were buttered on because of Bob. I just made that up, by the way. <laughs> so this French lady knew what side her baguettes were buttered on because of Bob and men like Bob. And she would say, oh, Bob, welcome, come in, so nice to see you. Was that French or G Russian or German? I don't know. <laughs> but Bob would or, greet her in French speak French the whole time. Mitch, would you like to order something? Bob, if this was a German place, I could do it for us. But So he ordered in French for me, and he loved it, and they loved him. And I, as an SF guy, was amazed and blown away that a man 75 years later has maintained his language proficiency and had just the love and the self-discipline to do it. During COVID, I couldn't see Bob, but I called him. And he got real sick, but not because of COVID. He spent some time in the hospital there, but he recovered. And early last summer, I had returned from a wildfire. I work wildfire response in ret Army retirement. Came back from a fire, and uh, the first thing, Mitch, welcome back. We can have visitors now. Roger that. When, when shall I come over? Let's say 2 o'clock tomorrow. You have to wear a mask, and we have to sit outside. Now, because of the COVID and the isolation, Bob was in a wheelchair, and he had 24-hour care. And as many of us have seen with our own eyes, family members or friends that uh, went downhill because of the isolation of COVID and the lack of interaction with other people. And I recognized, and Bob told me, and I'll, I'll put it in his words without his accent or his voice, Mitch, it's very important for people my age 
to continue to make friends and to be able to talk about our lives and things that we've done because we, our days are limited and we have so much life experience and we're grateful to, to meet people that want to hear about that experience and maybe pass it on to others. Um, to paraphrase, that's what he said almost every time we got together. And that's why he was so excited after uh, Fraser Meadows changed their rules that we could sit outside in masks and um, spend more time. So I'd go by the restaurant and buy, buy what I knew was his favorite meal. And they'd always throw in some extra baked goods because it was going to Bob. And the, I never hesitated, of course, to tell the lady at the restaurant, hey, I'm buying lunch for Bob. Oh, we have some special pastries for him. And then, so we'd get a half a bag of free French goodies. And I'd always tell Bob, hey, I dropped Bob Kehoe's name at the restaurant, Bob, and here's our free chow, which he was delighted. That was one of his favorite words, by the way. Delighted. Oh, that's delightful. What a gentleman. Who says those words these days? So I didn't, know, I didn't know about Bob until I had read Will Irwin's book. But when you, you read a book sometimes and you, and you nominate somebody as your hero. And then Bob allowed me to become his friend. And I got to know his, his adult children my age when they were caring for him during the height of the pandemic. Bob was very grateful to know that his World War II service was remembered and appreciated. And that we in the Special Forces community know who he is, are grateful for what he's provided us, and that we are still carrying on the legacy and literally the lessons learned from him. He did enjoy making new friends. He really did. And uh, if you read the little bio blurb in the program, there's something in there that I want to emphasize because Bob emphasized it. And that is, just because we get older doesn't mean we don't like making new friends. And um, I and, and many of you now are at the age, sadly, where we are losing friends faster than we are making them. And I want to encourage all of us to keep making new friends. We are friends and brothers and sisters here in this room. But somewhere out there, there is an old vet that we haven't met yet that might not have served in the regiment but still would like to tell us about his service. And we would be better men and women for listening to it. The one OSS story that Bob shared that's not written anywhere has to do with the other Jed team jumping into Brittany, France that same night, Team George. So Team George was commanded by Paul Sear, who died in South Carolina in the mid-90s, CYR. But Paul Sear was the commander of Team George, and Team George and Team Frederick got told the night before infill, hey, you're going to be jumping in with a bunch of uh, French SAS guys, and uh, they're going to get their jihad on that night, on my term, not theirs. And the, then the Jedberg teams said, whoa, who are the French SAS? Nobody said that we're jumping in with 100 other dudes or 50 other dudes. They're going to start killing Germans and blowing up rail lines that same night. That's going to be too high a signature. We're a three-man team. We're used to doing this on our own. Why 50 other dudes the same night, same aircraft? Three separate aircraft, not all in, in, in one. Who, can, who in here hasn't been given some frago to the mission the day before? You go, oh, bullshit. Uh, I don't like this. <laughs> all of us. Well, Sear and Adrian, Adrian, Bob's commander, Adrian Wise, and Paul Sear, the other commander, protested up the chain of command. And the, one of the head OSS guys for England said, it'd be jolly good if you went along with this, lads. Ah, uh, cheerio. Keep calm, carry on. I made that part up. But they basically said, hey, suck it up and drive on. But in that British kind of polite way. What's not written down anywhere is that at the airfield outside of Oxford, England, along the barbed wire fence, the night before the jump, Paul Sear 
commander of Team George, and Bob Kehoe, radio operator on Team Frederick, the only two Americans of these two Jedburgh teams, walked along the, the barbed wire and bitched to each other about the French SAS, complaining that, holy shit, what are we getting into? Sear had no other Americans to talk to about it, and Bob, as a 22-year-old, E7 at the time, Roger, Captain, whatever you want to say, we're going to walk and talk about it. But when Bob said, Paul Sear and I walked along the fence that night, and he was very upset about this mission, and I wasn't excited about it either, I said, Bob, stop right there. Say that again. I said, Bob, that's not written anywhere. It's documented that Sear was upset about jumping in with the SAS. It's documented that you weren't happy either, but it's documented nowhere that you two American Jedbergs commiserated that night before you put your shoots on and went out to the airfield. Well, I'm happy. I'm happy to share that with you, Mitch. Bob, I'm going to tell other people this because this is OSS history that's lost forever. Thank you for telling me, and I'm sharing it with you all now. Um, that's the bonus of coming to this. A small bonus of coming in here today is you just heard a piece of OSS history that now won't be lost because we have so many force multipliers in here to carry it on. But there's been, there, there, we can all think of times where we and a teammate complained about the mission that we've been handed and just had to go ahead and do it. And it was happening uh, in June of 1944 with our own OSS. Every visit, every visit with Bob was a blessing. And every time I drove there, I thank God that I'm going to spend time with a man that has done so much in such a humble way for our country. Something else about Bob, and I'm going to see if we can make this work. I bought a Morse code key in an oscillator online. There's a guy that um, um, 3D prints them out of plastic, and he's a ham guy, but he also does 3D printing. So I bought a Morse key in an oscillator, and I brought it over in one of my last visits with Bob, and I said, hey, uh, hey, First Sergeant. I would like you to establish headquarters with Special Force London. Special Force headquarters in London, please. And I'm going to film it, if you don't mind. OK. So this is Team Frederick contact, contacting London. Let me see if it, it can work. I'll let it loop. But that's, that is Team Frederick's call sign being transmitted from a memory 75 years old for the first time in 75 years. Billy, I'll let that play a little bit if you want to video it. Notice his sending finger taps the table. Now, when I learned Morse code, albeit poorly and slowly, I, I, I wasn't taught to tap the table between groups. Somewhere in, o, in Camp Crowder or OSS radio operator training. Is that what it was? Bob is tapping between groups. He's, he's tapping the, the table with his, his forefinger. I, I, as I was also cross-trained as a radio operator, I, I didn't get taught that, that technique. Ricks, who was also an echo, said uh, a wrist bump off of... Yep, yep. So, so if you, Rick just said, as I'm pointing out, Bob is tapping the table with his fingertip to put a break between the call sign and the next group. Rick said that he was taught to just roll your hand a little bit with a wrist bump onto the surface. I had learned neither of those. I was the worst 18 echo in the Army when I was. Which probably why, yeah. But I want to let this up here for a second because Bob hadn't touched, he wasn't a ham radio operator. He hadn't touched a Morse key since China in 1945. And this is him last summer uh, sending out his Team Frederick call sign at his, assist, at his now assisted living facility 
in Boulder, Colorado. And Bob died just uh, two weeks after this visit. So I had, I had met Jack Singlaub last summer, and I'll tell you that story in a minute. And uh, Jack Singlaub was buddies at Milton Hall in England with Adrian Wise, who was Bob's commander on Team Frederick. That's a lot to digest, but Bob's commander was also Singlaub's buddy. I had told General Singlaub that Bob has copies of his Team Frederick after action report written by Adrian Wise. General Singlaub said, I'd love to see that. So I told Bob that uh, Jack Singlaub, the only other American Jedburg last summer, would love to see Adrian's AAR of your Team Frederick mission. So Bob had his daughter dig it out of the files and at our very last visit, Bob handed me the Team Frederick report written by Singlob's buddy, Adrian Wise, and said, please give this to General, to Jack, with my compliments. And I said, Bob, that's probably one of the nicest things you've ever told me, because you are allowing me to be a courier for the OSS, to carry a report from one JED team to another. What an honor. Thank you. I will. Uh, Bob didn't know that Adrian and Sing Adrian Wise and Jack Singla were buddies from England, but they were in Bravo Company, and they were in the same section, Adrian Wise and Jack Singla. Adrian Wise and Jack Singla conducted a second OSS mission in France, and I'll talk to you about that in a minute, and that's not well known either. But the last thing that... Um, we talked about was, please pass this mission to Jack with my compliments. And I said, Bob, I promise you that I will. On, on to some of y'all's old commander. John K. Singlaub, he turned 100 on July 10th. He's living in Tennessee, about 30 miles south of Nashville. He was in the 515th Parachute Infantry Regiment at Benning. Some of you may have known that he broke his ankle on a jump, and while healing, he stuck around Fort Benning and he went through demo training. So he became the regimental demolitions officer too. A pretty damn good uh, background with some foreign language ability already. College, he was a UCLA Army ROTC graduate. So paratrooper, uh, infantryman and a demo guy. Perfect raw material for the Jeds. And he heard the call for volunteers for hazardous duty behind enemy lines at Fort Benning. This is a famous photo. Many of you have seen this before. <clears throat> because Jack, Major General Retired Singlaub, was, uh, he, to the Brits, he was a prototypical Hollywood looking American square jawed freedom fighter with hands that could like, you know, crack walnuts. And so he was in a lot of photos. This was just a glamour shot of him modeling different types of OSS jump gear. He didn't jump with this stuff. This wasn't the night before his jump. This was just, right, Lieutenant saying loud, another photo shoot, put on the kit. So he just manned up and did it. That's him in the middle, Jed Team James. Square-jawed freedom fighter. So Team James jumped into kind of central southern France much later than Team Frederick did, the Corrèze department. You know, the, like the little, France is divided up into departments, not little provinces or counties. So it was the Corrèze department if you've read his book, Hazardous Duty, you read about uh, him jumping in. You might have read about him climbing up into the second floor of a barn to get the drop on some Germans in a 37-millimeter anti-tank gun. 
and he realizes at the very last minute that, oh, they've got the drop on me too. <laughs> and gets out of the way of that upper window right before they put a 37 millimeter anti-tank round through it. He gets his bell rung, he gets, uh, he gets wounded, but he uh, climbs down <clears throat> and he picks up a Bren gun, which is a light machine gun with a mag that sticks out the top, as you may remember. Kind of that big, wide, curving mag. Picks up a Bren gun, works his way around till he gets the drop on that gun crew that had just got the drop on him. And he puts, at 60 yards, puts two magazines into those lousy krauts and puts an end to that 37 millimeter crew. Uh, this is in the town of Eglaton. And uh, while there, they shoot down an HE-111, a German two-engine bomber. He uh, has the Maquis, the French resistance, lead, and then one of them, one of the planes comes in and it doesn't need any lead and they stitch up the cockpit, they stitch up the engine, they uh, send this HE-111 away smoking and it's uh, la later believed that it, it crashes and kills the crew. So Singlaub directs the downing of a German bomber while they're getting strafed by uh, F FW-190s also. A sporty start to his JED mission. And it wasn't that long. You can see um, that, they're, that they're there for, how long are they there for? Just August 11th, this is September 26th. They, they, called in, they called in resupplies. They did a little bit of advising, but the conventional military was advancing fast. So this wasn't, it didn't have significant strategic impacts say for example like Jed Team James and Frederick did, but it still uh, uh, assisted the resistance in that area. He shot down a bomber, uh, he killed a gun crew uh, single-handedly, and he got out of there alive. And as, and as soon as he got back to England, he, he wanted something more. And Adrian Wise said, uh, Jack, I've got to go back to Brittany. I'll, okay, he didn't say that. He said, uh, Lieutenant, Jack, I'm being asked to go back into Brittany, France. I have to reactivate some of my intel networks. There are 30,000 Germans cut off in the Brittany Peninsula that uh, higher headquarters is concerned about their ability to strike, break out and attack the Normandy beachheads and sever the Red Ball Express, our lines of communication coming out of Normandy. Would you like to come with me? Singlaub said yes. They took a patrol boat from England and they inflated a two-man, what would, we would call an RB7, a rubber raiding craft, and they paddled ashore at the fishing village of St. Briec on the northern coast of the Brittany Peninsula and spent just a week literally reactivating the networks that Team Frederick had already set up. Significant to this story is the photo that General Singlaub himself is pointing to. General Singlaub is pointing to Adrian Wise. This photograph appears in many history books about the OSS with the wrong caption. A, an author, well thank you authors for writing about the OSS, sees Jack Singlaub and sees a German and automatically thinks, oh, this is Jed Team James. He's interrogating a German prisoner. However, as General Singlaub pointed out, the presence of Adrian Wise in this photo, and you can still re recognize that face from the team, picture of Team Frederick standing next to, Bo next to Bob Kehoe. The presence of Adrian Wise indicates that this was taken in the first week of October on, their sec on Bob's second, correction, on Singlaub and Wise's second mission into France. Adrian Wise and Jack Singlaub were only in France together that first week of October, reactivating the, the intel networks to inform on the Germans. So here's another grain of history that we will now forever be professional nitpickers when we pick up the next OSS history book. And if you see this photo, oh look, they got it wrong, just like Mitch said. Uh, this is the intel mission into Brittany, France, 
Wise and Singlob in the same photo? Oh, that's October 44, I'm damn sure of it. Sir, what's your proof? Uh, Jack Singlob said it was. And there you have it. Um, and I won't, I won't bust the books that I've seen it in, but damn good history books. Guess what? You know, General Singlob, he wrote, he and um, you know, a ghostwriter wrote his own autobiography. Even, this is General Singlob's autobiography, and the caption isn't as good as it could be. So when you guys have a ghostwriter, even, even check the captions they put on your book, will you? What General Singlob, in his own words, is most proud of his, of his World War II service is the POW rescue mission that he did on Hainan Island in 1945. Hainan Island, Japanese prisoner of war camp holding mostly Commonwealth prisoners, some, some Australians, some New Zealanders, and some Dutch prisoners of war. The Team Pigeon was sent in to make sure that the Japanese did not kill them. There was no place good to land near the POW camp. So what did Jack Singlob do? Maybe you know the story. He still had his jump harness from a, their prior jump. So he had his jump harness and he took the pilot's bailout chute from the seat of the aircraft and he rigged it up to the harness that he was already wearing. And he said, I hope this works. <laughs> and he had the pilot fly over an open field next to the POW camp, and he jumped. And he pulled the ripcord, and it opened. And he landed safely. And he was uh, an acting major then, because they knew that you've got to be a field grade if you want to intimidate Japanese uh, company grade officers, you better be a field grade. And this is the famous photo of Major Singlaub with his back to the Japanese to shame them, and his Nisei interpreter, Frank, who, all, who has his back closest to us in this photo. This is that's an American, uh, Japanese-American soldier. Frank is his interpreter, and he's telling the Japanese captain, the Major will not speak to anyone but another Major or above. And, you know, these uh, enemy soldiers, they were, rather than go to guns or samurai swords, they were being shamed and baffled. And the presence of mind that, he, that Sing Laub had as a 22 or 23 year old to do this, nobody told him other than, field grade officer, you can get inside their head. He came up with all this on his own. But they were responsible for hundreds of POWs not being executed and finally getting uh, medical treatment and taken by rail to a higher level of care. And in his own words, that's what he's proudest of is the humanitarian rescue mission that he did on Hainan Island. So I, so I have met, met him briefly before at Colonel Banks' funeral. For those of you that were at Aaron Banks' funeral in San Clemente in April of 2004, you may remember when Jack Singlaud showed up at the small, the small little uh, gathering place that we had. I briefly shook his hand and said hello. I was Catherine Banks' escort and her casualty assistance officer, so I didn't have time to talk to the general. Plus, I was a friggin' captain then, and I'm not going to... Hi, hey, Major General, I'm a captain. <laughs> I haven't even, I've only got one combat tour so far. Um, so I wanted to meet him, though, and I wanted to uh, connect with him to help connect him and Bob Kehoe while Bob was still alive. So I wrote an email to Joyce Luster at Fifth Group, and Miss Luster gave my email to Scott Brower, who passed my contact info to the family, I got their mailing address, sent the general a letter with a few gifts, one of them, uh, the Jed, Jed Wings from John Joyce, and uh, established my bona fides with them. And because of the time that it was, I ensured them that I would follow all COVID protocols, whatever they wanted, and they invited me over. And I stopped by the house, and that's how it started. It was just uh, another, 
I want to meet one of my Jedburg forefathers. I'm going to find a polite way to do it. I'm going to ask the right permissions. And people want to have their elderly relatives and heroes meet new people. So this is me at the general's house. Um, whenever I show up or whenever I leave, I render a hand salute. And I report in and I ask to be dismissed. And he laughs every time. He still likes, to, I, I uh, call him by his first name, General. <laughs> and he'll, he might say Mitch or he might say Lieutenant Colonel. But he's always happy to smile and say, you're dismissed. And then I'll shake my hand and say, make sure you come back. Come back again soon. And I do. I visit regularly. I report to him on how things are going with Robin Sage. He had a home in Colorado, so I talked to him about wildfires. Hey, Dave. General Singlob is still engaged, and he's still connected, and he's still interested in what we got going on. He does like to hear every four times a year about how the students did at Robin Sage. He thinks it's really neat that me and Rick, who served together in Berlin 35 years ago, are once again serving side by side in the field. He's really tickled about that. He thinks that's really something. He likes to say, that's terrific. Uh, Command Sergeant Major retired Mike Sams, the former uh, SWIC Sergeant Major, gave me a bundle of Pineland money called Don. You remember Pineland Don? And I, I gave a, a wad of money to, Pineland money to General Singhal my last visit, and he thought that was really interesting. So that's, that photo on the left is General Singhal looking at Pineland Don and uh, just enjoying hearing about how complex and layered the Robin Sage exercise is that we have fake money that are parts of the scenario and good things and bad things happen related to the Don, as you know, in the Robin Sage exercise. He likes getting gifts also from the regiment. And uh, Dave, Dave DeSusi just walked in and uh, Dave, that's the chapter 75 Jed Wings that the general is wearing on his vest that you sent me, that I gave him and that he wears it almost every time, and I'm grateful for that. And I gave it to him in the year of the 75th anniversary also, so it was a double good deal that chapter 75 and the 75th anniversary of his jump into Normandy, correction, into the Corez department. So there is some uh, SF swag that he gets, and if you are, if you make SF swag and you'd like uh, Jack Singlob, or if you got a product that you would like uh, in the hands of General Singlaub. Well, I got business cards up here and we'll make, we'll make a plan and I'll give it to him and I'll take pictures and I'll send it back to you and you can just know that you've brightened his day and made him a little happier. Whether it's protein powder from Alpha Elite Performance, you know we got a SF guy who makes protein powder, Travis. Uh, well, I was at their house one time and the family buys him the Costco protein powder the guy drinks protein shakes still, and he rides a recumbent bike. And I said, General, you, 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 drink, you eat the same cheap-ass protein powder that I do. How about I get you some good stuff from an SF guy? So Travis sent it, and we enjoyed a protein powder toast, and I sent Travis the picture. Whether it's uh, stuff from Ashton Naylor or Dave DeSusi or uh, Frank Allen or John Joyce or you name it, uh, the general likes getting that stuff. He still likes to read and watch documentaries. Um, I always bring a history book with him, with me when I visit, whether pictures or words, and we sit out back and look at the stuff, and now he likes to nitpick that photo of him and Adrian Wise, always pointing out, that's the wrong caption. That was in October. And uh, he now, he still remembers the names of guys that he served with, even their first names. There'll be a picture of uh, Outpost Harry from his time in Korea. And the captions say, you know, Lieutenant so-and-so. Well, this is Dan. He was a West Pointer. So he's still sharp. He's still sharp. He's not so verbal anymore because of a brain bleed that he had in December. 
but he's, he's all in there. His emotions are all there. His memories are all there. And his ability to appreciate company and visits is all still there. Speaking of company and visits, Tilt uh, sometimes visits, and we'll, occasionally we have an opportunity to the three of us to be there together. And you can see Miss Joan, his wife, she's laughing in the background as us three guys st uh, sit there over lunch and count up how many, how many uh, countries that had bad things happening uh, in them while we were there. So that's, that's our list in that photo, me, Tilt, and the general, how many places we've, um, we've been where bad things were happening. And this is, this is ge the general receiving the Team Frederick AAR. I also had the sad duty of informing him on this visit <clears throat> but that uh, general, with Bob Kehoe's compliments, here's the Team Frederick report written by your friend Adrian Wise. And I'm, I have the sad duty to tell you, General, that, that Bob died last week in his sleep in Boulder, Colorado. Now, I've done real casualty notification before in, the, in uniform at somebody's front door. But doing this one was just as hard because Bob, Bob Kehoe knew Jack Singlaub mostly from their reunions. They weren't that close during the war because they were on separate teams. But General's eyes welled up when I told him that Bob has passed. And I said, General, Bob wanted you to have this. He was grateful. He was hoping that we could call him on the phone the day that I did this. But now, General, this, this now leaves you the last American Jedberg. And he didn't say anything. The tears just welled up in his eyes, and he didn't say anything. And it was a very quiet, muted, somber, sad visit. There is, though, there is one Brit British Jed still living, Fred Bailey. And uh, I've been able to connect Fred and Jack Singlob through their families by just re reading emails back and forth. But this photo here is the day of casualty notification to General Singlob of First Sergeant Kehoe and the day that General Singlob knew that of the 100 American Jeds that there were, you, sir, are the last. I didn't mention this during my talk about Bob, but Bob, Bob took a PhD after the war and went on to serve in the CIA for 35 years. That's the Distinguished Service Cross awarded to Bob Kehoe for his serving as a radio operator in Team Frederick in Brittany, France. And that's the French Croix de Guerre. And that is the uh, Silk Evasion map that he jumped in with. And I'm grateful that John gave us this long to talk and share. And I, uh, I've provided you all my thoughts during my time up here. I don't have any clever concluding remarks. I just want you to know that the families are grateful that we had the opportunity to talk about their heroes, that uh, the Singlaub family asks, they said, Mitch, make this the last thing that you say, that uh, General Singlaub wants, to, wants you to encourage people at this presentation to continue to fight for your country, our country. You know, he, to, he took an ass chewing in the Oval Office from Jimmy Carter because he was saying the right thing and trying to do the right thing. And the Singlob family and the general pays close attention to what's happening in our country these days. And that's his message. The message from the last American Jedberg is to continue to fight 
for our country uh, because we recognize, and so does he, the threats that it's facing internally and externally. And with that, I have fulfilled my promise to him. And with this, I have fulfilled my promise to Bob. And now we all know more about our OSS history and the great men that have gone before us and provided us the country that we have now. Let's honor their memory and keep fighting for it. Thank you for being here. Thank you.